Letter six of Your Affectionate Godmother. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Storylines Devon. Your Affectionate Godmother by Eleanor Glynn. Letter six, April 1913. As this is the last letter I shall write to you before we meet, Caroline, I shall have to collect all the little things I want to say to you, which are much easier to write than to express personally. And so, first, I shall begin by suggesting what you had better avoid. The whole tendency, as I think I said in a former letter, of modern society is toward rowdiness and vulgarity, and if one is very young and full of spirits, it is so easy to be led away into indiscretions when one sees most of one's companions doing the same thing. But it is very foolish, and not in our scheme, to secure for you prestige and a brilliant future, my child, so I shall be quite ruthless in what I am going to say. It is very much the fashion now to lunch and dine at restaurants. Even the most youthful debutantes go to them with their chaperones, or to large boy and girl dinners before balls or theatre parties, when there may be only one or two of the mothers present. I must give you a few hints as to what I notice as common and unattractive behaviour on these occasions. One can derive a cynical amusement from sitting quietly and watching the entrance and exit of people in restaurants, so atrocious are the movements of most of them. It is seldom that anyone seems to remember that in public true distinction is shown by the quietest and most dignified bearing. You will see women and girls flustering in, dragging on their gloves and taking great strides or waddling in these very narrow skirts, all self-conscious and plainly aware that they are being observed by those sitting on the chairs at the sides of the halls. In a public place, true breeding should give you the same repose as at home, and all but your own personal acquaintances should be apparently unobserved. So, Caroline, cultivate this unconscious bearing. Finish your toilet in the way of adjustment of gloves, etc., etc., before you leave the dressing room, and then walk easily and without looking about you to join your party. And when you are at the table, do not lean your elbows upon it. If you have this deplorable modern habits in your own or intimate friends' houses, for heaven's sake, leave it behind you when you come out. To see a lot of, presumably, ladies lounging all over the cloth as they lean forward eagerly to talk to their vis-a-vis -vis or the persons next to them is not an engaging sight. And only a few years ago, it would have been considered as branding them as belonging to another world. Whatever laxity of Denue has become habitual in private life, surely you can realise that it is very cheap to indulge in it in public and that the fact that everything is cheap now is no reason for you who are starting in life and wish to be distinguished to follow the fashion. There is another frightful thing numbers of people do as they leave restaurants. You will see them twisting their tongues round their teeth or making some movement of the lips which gives the impression that they have hardly finished their meal as they walk out. It is perfectly revolting. It seems horrible to have to speak of such things, child, but one sees them happen so constantly that I am obliged to warn you. Try to walk through halls gracefully, without self-consciousness or swinging arms, and when the dinner has begun, enter into the spirit of it and endeavour to be agreeable to your neighbours. But never forget that you are in a public place 
and that at other tables there are strangers whom you do not know and before whom you certainly do not wish to make yourself of no account. I have seen boy and girl parties at restaurants where, if one had not known the names of the actual people, one would have presumed they were a set of young hoydens imagining themselves at a village feast. All noisy and unrestrained behaviour is really very vulgar in any mixed company. I'm sure you will agree with me about this, Caroline. And if you will give yourself time to reflect what self-respect really means, you will discover that, if it is innate, it will guide you better than any words of mine, and that even as an acquired quality it makes the only infallible standard to judge the expediency or inexpediency of certain conduct by. You may, if you are petulant, retort, goodness gracious, if I have got to be thinking all the time of how I am behaving, I shall be a stuck-up unnatural thing and won't have any fun. Now, listen, Caroline. We will make the simile that society is an operatic stage, or, to give you a still more up-to-date example, the Russian ballet. A certain organised institution. It could not go on if the dancers had not been taught at all and thought they could cavort about as they pleased on the plea of being natural. The higher the state of their training, the more perfectly natural do their movements appear. So you, before entering society, should learn in such perfection all the technical part of polish that to do the right thing comes naturally to you and gives you time, so to speak, to encourage your individual talent and be a Pavlova or Karsavina. But if you are only at the stage of the last joined chorus girl, you cannot hope to dance the pas sol. Should you desire to be so perfectly savage that you need never think if you're doing ugly and unattractive things or not, then you have no business to try to enter society at all, which is admittedly a civilised circle with standards of behaviour which are the result of centuries of evolution. It is not a primeval forest where you can climb trees and roll on the grass at will. No one forces you to enter society, but for heaven's sake, if you do, decide to do it well. I wonder if you smoke, dear girl. There would be no use in my saying that I personally think it looks utterly unattractive to see a very young girl puffing her cigarette because I know that I'm old-fashioned and, in this, have not gone with the times. But such is my opinion. Should you not have begun to smoke yet, Caroline, put it off as long as possible. And if you do take to it, let it be because you really like it, not for a pose, as some girls do. If you have acquired the habit already, be very careful of your teeth as you get older and to have your hair beautifully brushed both night and morning. The smell of stale smoke in the hair and breath and clothes is so disgusting. While we're talking of personal habits and such things, you will notice that quantities of girls are not particular about their hands these days. The outdoor games and the boyish carelessness about wearing gloves have almost destroyed beautiful white hands in the present generation, and you will often see the ugliest housemaid's fists upon the Lady Clara Vere de Vere, whose mothers are famed for the beauty of their own fingers. Try to counteract by care the inevitable effect of outdoor games upon your hands, Caroline, Use creams, wear gloves when it is possible, and keep your nails nicely polished. Why let one good thing spoil another? Games are good for the health, and pretty white fingers are pleasant to the sight. Indeed, 
Whatever your personal disadvantages may be, use the greatest intelligence and get art to remedy them. Do not let them slide with a casual idea that they are only youth and that you will grow out of them. I am staying in a hotel in the south at the present moment, where there is an extraordinarily pretty young girl whose mother has allowed her to stoop and stand all crooked. Her stockings are wrinkled and, with a snowy neck, her arms are red and blotchy while she leans upon the table and eats in a horrible manner with bright red paws, holding her knife and fork ungracefully. And last of all, her hair is arranged with that awful bundle of sausage curls which I warned you about. The mother looks a charming woman, but evidently has not what the Americans call the natural horse sense to see that her poor child is being shamefully handicapped and will be so for years until the necessity to remove these drawbacks strikes her own intelligence. But to turn from material things, there is another curious wave over society which renders women less attractive than they were, and it is caused by their numerical supremacy. A large percentage of them are the seekers, not the sought after. They actually hunt men. The mothers for their daughters, the girls for themselves, so that the attitude of most of the modern jeunes dorés is one of self-defence. They are so sick of invitations being poured upon them, of being grabbed for this and that, so wearied with girls flinging themselves at their heads, that their manners have often become of an insolence that would not have been tolerated 20 years ago. But who can blame them? I implore you, Caroline, to remain an old maid 20 times over rather than so degrade your sex. Lots of girls are frightfully eager about their partners, ferreting them out and reminding them of their engagements. I am sure you're not of this sort, child, but I am only telling you of these horrid ways so that you may observe them and not be led into them unconsciously by seeing them practised by your companions. If you have, with modesty shown, you are agreeable and desirable to the young men, you will have aroused their hunting instinct, which is always longing to find expression, especially nowadays, when they themselves have to play so often the part of the hunted. If you find yourself not a success, you must ask yourself why this is so. You must not get nervous about being left behind and turn into a seeker. There are many girls who seem very popular and get plenty of public attention, but who behave themselves so that they are spoken of lightly by every young man. Would such popularity be worth having? And what would it bring in a few years? Not much happiness, I fear. For even if one of these girls does marry, she will not have earned the respect of her husband nor will she have controlled her own emotions or desires sufficiently to be able to maintain any stable position in life. When I look back upon those of this sort that I knew when I was young, I ask myself, where are they now? Some of them are weary old maids. Some have made hole and corner still enduring wretched marriages and some have gone under and are divorced and forgotten. Look to the end, my dear girl, is an excellent motto to apply to everything, especially to any common little pleasure of the moment. After the first season or two, if a girl does not marry, she will have drifted into one set or another, and you can judge instantly of her status and prestige by the men she collects round her. If for the reason of not meeting someone whom you feel you really want to marry, or for any other reason you should remain free for a while, 
Try at least to have for your friends only the best and nicest, because, as I have said again and again, like draws like, and the best is not likely to be eventually found in the second best circle. And I want you to have the best in everything, Caroline. Do not, as some girls do, look upon society as simply the means to the securing of a husband. For although I told you in one of my former letters the goal of a sensible girl is matrimony, still she must come naturally to this state through having, by her own charm and complete equipment, mental and physical, attracted a suitable mate. She must not have in front of her marriage as a necessity and so be ready to grab any creature who may show himself willing with her to enter the bond. But again, real self-respect would ward off any of these dangers. So if you have it, Caroline, my advice is unnecessary. The woman who secures a husband by manoeuvres and scheming often against the poor fellow's will, is perfectly certain to secure unhappiness of some sort, as well as a certain degradation to her spirit. There are several notorious cases of this kind in society, which you will be able to observe, Caroline. Supposing by chance that your tastes should turn to more serious matters than just the amusements of balls and games and the pleasures of your age. Never be carried away by any fad or any new idea, as are numbers of girls who are so highly educated that they have come rather away from their more frivolous sisters. Fads are abnormal and always show some unbalance. One often hears would-be deep thinkers announcing platitudes in cant phrases and they frequently influence the young and impressionable. You have often, for instance, heard them making remarks about the rights of man. Now, ask yourself a common sense question. What are the rights of man? you will find that the answer is that there are no such things. Man has evolved and certain civilizations have conceded him certain privileges. But as he made no bargain with the creator when he entered the world, he cannot possibly have any rights. Servants have rights because they are doing specified work for food and wages. They have made a bargain. All human beings have rights between themselves when they make an agreement of exchange. But man, just man in the abstract, can have no rights at all. For with whom did he make a bargain? From whom can he claim them? So when you hear people using this phrase, you may know that they are talking balderdash and have not thought about the matter. Woman has no rights either. The whole aspect of these things for woman is largely a question of geography, climate and custom. One might say the only natural right a woman appears to have is to become a mother because this seems to be her obvious mission in the scheme of things. But the necessities of civilization and the laws of her country have, above all things, restricted for her this privilege, except under certain given circumstances laid down by law. So you see, Caroline, when you come to analyse this phrase of rights, it all falls to pieces. I have only referred to it by chance as an illustration of the folly of using cant phrases. Never pretend to be clever in any way. Be natural and easy, with that trained ease which is the highest attribute of breeding. Another defect girls often have is shyness, and very few people stop to analyse its cause. Shyness, when we have got down to the bedrock of it, is pure personal egotism. People are shy because they fancy others are observing them. If they were not so conscious of themselves, they would not be obsessed with this idea. 
they would realise that they are probably not really very interesting and may never have struck others' consciousness at all. But no, the perpetual, ever-present perception of self makes them awkward, makes them wonder what effect they're producing, makes them nervous and the prey of every foolishness. Whereas, if they were not so sensitively occupied with their own feelings, they would do natural things without a tremor. I have no patience when I hear a woman in great position being excused for stiffness or brusqueness by the plea of, oh, she's so dreadfully shy. It is not real humility. Real humility would not be conscious of self at all. It is vanity and egotism, and when seen in a grown woman casts a very poor reflection upon those who had the charge of her bringing up from earliest childhood. If you are shy, Caroline, take yourself sternly to task. Analyse what makes you so and overcome it. Bashfulness and shyness are as great faults as boldness and perhaps cause more unhappiness. The antithesis of shyness is bumptiousness, and this also comes from egotism. It is a different expression of the same fundamental fault. Try to eradicate the root if you have a tendency to either of its demonstrations. There are all sorts of modern philosophers, in petticoats mostly, but still some of them are men, who, with more or less subtle reasoning, are trying to inculcate an idea of the necessity of individualism in all women. They urge every unit to express her individuality, with the result that the average female, who is little higher than the animal world in intelligence and not half so endowed with instinct, is becoming a perfect bore. She has not the sense to see that, if she were really gifted, nothing on earth could keep her from being individual, and that, if she is not so, to try to push forward her commonplace ideas only clogs the wheels of progress for the general company. Numbers of foolish feather brains, bitten with the idea that they have this high mission of showing their individuality, have upset all possibility of their own happiness and that of their families. Numbers of the poor suffragettes are composed of these. The mass of women could not have been intended to be individual by the laws of nature, not of man, and the few who are highly gifted have unconsciously been raised on pedestals without their own effort. These are the first to comprehend that it is necessary to look facts straight in the face and to realise that when it comes to the last stand, no matter what laws are made, man will still be the master through physical force. And, oh, it would be perfectly frightful, would it not, Caroline dear, if we got back to a state where men were obliged to club us to get their own way. I am talking of this because I have often in these letters urged you to acquire prestige through individuality, so I must explain that you may not misunderstand me. The thing I have been suggesting for you is social, the individuality which exquisite manners and courtesy and understanding can alone graft upon your natural talents and careful education. Any other sort in a young girl turns to eccentricity. And if, when I see you, I perceive that, though sweet and well-educated, you are still of a commonplace turn of mind, I shall desist from teaching you to be a personage, but encourage you to take sensible pleasure in the things suitable to your brain capacity, and so you will become a happy little wife and a valuable atom of the community of England's best society. And now, Caroline dear, I must conclude, and next week, when we meet in London, I hope we shall clasp hands in mutual contentment. Your affectionate godmother, E. G. End of letter six. Recording by Storylines, Devon.
Letter 7 of Your Affectionate Godmother This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Storylines, Devon Your Affectionate Godmother by Eleanor Glynn Letter 7, January 1914 since you came out last may caroline dear we have seen so much of each other at intervals that i've been able to tell you things and have had no occasion to write but as i shall be abroad for several months and you in england i shall have to begin again to help you in every way i can by letters as, far from my task being over after your presentation, we both found, did we not, dear child, that it had only just begun. Because there are always new questions cropping up, which you are sweet enough to want to ask my opinion about. And now I shall answer the one contained in your letter of yesterday. You write that you want to know what I think of the tango and whether you ought to dance it. Let us take the subject from its broadest point of view first, that of new fads and fashions in general, and then we can get down to this particular one which seems to be agitating so many minds in various countries. The first thing to realise is the utter futility of going against the spirit of the age. From the earliest days of civilization, waves of an irresistible desire for some change, some freer expression of emotion, have periodically swept over society. All the people with limited horizons of thought have immediately launched forth their protests and their horrified and outraged feelings upon whatever the subject happens to be have been expressed in frantic cries. But the spirit of the age has just laughed at them and gone its way, and they have either eventually had to fall in with its mandates or have been swept aside and left high and dry in loneliness. I have no space here or desire to bore you, Caroline dear, by giving instances in the past of what I mean. And besides, most of them have been already cited in the papers over this matter of the tango. But to stay too, everyone knows the horror the introduction of the valves created, and the thought of a lady bicycling would have made your grandmother shudder. About every fad, every fashion, every new thing which has started, the wise woman, Caroline, reserves judgment. Because these matters are not questions of right and wrong, which a sense of duty should direct her to have a decided opinion upon immediately. They are merely questions of taste and expediency, and a calm review of them first is necessary before making up the mind. If a girl or woman is of a sufficiently distinguished personality, and is endowed with prestige and a great social position, she can start originalities herself if she pleases. But if she is a very young girl, this is most hazardous, and the really sensible thing to do is to follow the oft-quoted maxim of the Prime Minister and wait and see. It is as foolish to plunge with ardour into an untested new fad which you may be ashamed of presently, as it is to treat it with antagonistic scorn and swear you will never have anything to do with it. Either cause of action may possibly place you in an undesirable or ridiculous position after a while, when the fad or fashion has either shown itself to be vulgar and impossible, or has come to stay. Give no opinion upon any radically new departure, my child. Quietly and in your own mind, weigh its merits and demerits, and see if they come above or below the standard of your own self-respect and the true sense of the fitness of things, and then presently decide for 
or against. Never be ruled by the outcries of old-fashioned people any more than you must be led away by the feather brains of your own age. But when you have arrived at the moment for decision, judge the thing itself by those two standards that I have just indicated, and not by what anyone else thinks of it. Ask yourself, if I play this game, or wear these clothes, or dance this dance, Am I degrading my ideal of myself in any way? Is there really something indecent or immodest in it? Or is it shrieked at simply because some of the shriekers are too old to enjoy it, or their minds have turned to whatever side of it they can fix upon which can be developed into something suggesting impropriety? When you have sifted the motives for the outcries against the new fashion, whatever it may be, and have come to your own conclusions, go along steadily on your way and be not disturbed, remembering always that excess in anything is undesirable and all eccentricity is vulgar in a young girl. There will be plenty of unbalanced youths and maidens in your world who will rush headlong into any new fad the instant it is suggested to them. Well, Caroline, be very sagacious, and let them be the ballon de se. Watch how the thing seems to you, and if it is likely to lead to pleasure or disgust. You will not have committed yourself to either side by this abeyance of expressed opinion and can, to use another political phrase, be safely seated upon the fence for a sufficient time to be able to decide whether the debated thing is only some small passing folly of one set or if it is really something brought by the spirit of the age. You will soon be able to settle this question and if you find that it has this omnipotent force at its back, do not hesitate to adapt it to your desires and use it gracefully. I have emphasised these three words on purpose, because therein lies the whole pith of the subject, for it is so often the manner of a thing which counts more than the matter. There is another important fact to be remembered, namely, the tremendous force of familiarity and custom which can turn startling innovations into unnoticeable and innocuous everyday occurrences. If one stops to think for a minute, one can conjure up numbers of sights which, viewed from a detached point, uninfluenced by the familiarity of custom, would seem horribly shocking to one or other of our senses. For instance, if we had never seen a butcher's shop before, some of us would faint at the first view of it. This unpleasant simile I give merely to show you in a very concrete and forcible manner what I mean. Your own intelligence will apply the test to other subjects. Thus I remember when first I saw a rather stout and elderly lady on a bicycle I felt a wave of repulsion, and with others in the street I turned my head to look at her in disgust. One sees them every day now, and one does not even remark the fact. I went with a party to a very fashionable restaurant to see in 1913, where as a rule only the elite of society congregate, and where reserve and decorum are the natural tone of the place. However, for the New Year's Eve feast, it seemed to have opened its doors to a crowd of the most aspiring inhabitants of suburbia, who afterwards danced in the ballroom. They indulged in wonderful bunny hugs and turkey trots, and probably the tango, although its name had not become so famous then, and I did not recognise it. I recollect how we stood and watched them and laughed at some of the sights respectable and often very plump mere de famille with agonised faces of strain in case they should forget a step were bumping against and clinging in strange fashion to some equally preoccupied partner i thought then how undignified how even revolting it was 
But now, when I go out here in Paris, even among the most recherche grand dames, and see them, grandmothers, some of them, taking their hour or two of exercise by dancing the tango, I am moved by no spirit of disgust. I merely feel critical as to whether or no they do it well. So far has custom and familiarity removed antipathy. So I want you to take this powerful factor into consideration, Caroline dear, in all matters of innovations. I want you to realise that they will become unremarkable and unimportant, so that the only sensible, just and sagacious way to look at them, if you should feel you wish to indulge in them, is to try to find out how far you can do so at that present moment of the day without making yourself ridiculous or looking unseemly. You can always exploit and expand your style when you see it is advisable. As I said before, there is no rigid law of right and wrong about such affairs. All are weighed by custom and suitability to present circumstances. As an illustration, I will tell you a story of perhaps 19 years ago. I was in one of the great capitals of Europe when bicycling was just starting, and at a court held, a young American girl was presented to the Queen. The presentations there were arranged quite differently to ours in England, and the august lady said a few words to each debutante. When it came to the turn of the American girl, the Queen, a lady of perhaps 45, asked her if she was interested in seeing the sights of the ancient city. Why, no, Your Majesty, the sprightly maiden replied. I bicyclate. Do you bicyclate? It is no end of fun. The Queen became very pink and said coldly, such pastimes are hardly suitable to my age or position, and passed on. But the nice point of the tale is that at that very moment the Sovereign was taking lessons in the strict privacy of her own royal garden. Only her perfect sense of the fitness of things made her not expose herself at that early day of the fashion in public, or even admit that she was countenancing the new exercise. Do not think for a moment, Caroline, that in all this that I have been saying, I am advocating a hypocritical course of conduct which may be applied to other things. This wait-and-see attitude I am only suggesting as prudent to adopt over such light masses as fashions and fads. But this, I hope, child, you have been intelligent enough to understand as you have read my words. You are fortunately not of that turn of mind which twists sentences to your own liking. So now, as I feel that you will have grasped my point of view about all new amusements and innovations, we can get on to the actual point of the much-discussed tango. It would seem that it has been brought by the spirit of the age, and so no outcries from any section of society will stop its progress. It will only cease to be danced when satiety has set in and the spirit which brought it has moved further on. Its great difficulty will help to lengthen its reign. Emperors and strict parents may desire its banishment and forbid its being indulged in by those over whose actions they have command, but presently their orders will be evaded by even these, for youth will have its way, and general society will do as it pleases. This being the case, Caroline, you can come off your prudent fence, where you were quite right to sit until now and take the very best lessons in the tango you can procure without a troubled thought in your pretty head as to whether or no you ought to dance a dance of low Argentine origin, or whether or no vulgar and immodest people can weave it into some unpleasant features. The more they do so, the more gracefully and in the more distinguished fashion can you try to practice it. 
Do not endeavour to learn too many steps. Stick to a few until you can do them so well that you can dance with any good partner without that look of strain overspreading your face and in the certainty that you will be able to follow his lead. You can say to him as you start, I only know such and such steps. Try at first to peep at yourself moving in some long mirror. Notice if your attitude is graceful and sufficiently reserved without being stiff. And one thing I do implore of you, Caroline, do not cavort constantly with any creature who may have crept into the houses where you go just because he is a good tango dancer, if he has no other quality to recommend him. Try to stick to the young men of your own class and set, whose company you are accustomed to in other games and other moments. They will learn to become good dancers soon enough when they find that for them to do so is the wish of the nicest girls. If you want an instance of what I mean, there was a perfectly admirable illustration in the Daily Mirror not long ago in that page where the funny sketches are. I think it was called Her Ladyship's Tango Partner or some such title, and it was exquisitely humorous and gives the exact note of what I'm advising you about. If you did not happen to see it, get the back numbers and look it up, as it would show you exactly the way that it is undesirable that you should have to look at those young men whom you allow to be your partners. When they have sunk into just that her ladyship's tango partners, then you can know that I should not approve of your dancing with them unless you have deliberately paid them to teach you when the situation is different and you turn into pupil and master, not a thoughtless Caroline, using some humble person for her own ends without remuneration or with the remuneration of favours which should only be granted to those of her own class. There are always weird people in society among all ranks who seem to take a delight in removing barriers and the landmarks of suitable conduct by bringing paid instructors of fashionable pastimes out of their places, making everyone round them uncomfortable and themselves conspicuous. These people, no matter what their worldly rank may be, must have some strong strain of vulgarity in themselves not to understand better the sense of the fitness of things, and they do much to sound the death knell of the pastime itself. You should never forget that gentle courtesy is due from you to every paid instructor you employ in any of your games, but no familiarity. And if the golf master, or the skating master, or the tango master respects himself, he will be disgusted with you if you forget your place with him. I believe this is quite unnecessary advice to you, Caroline Child, but I cannot help giving it. So unpleasantly surprised have I been at the behaviour I have witnessed among some girls who ought to have known better. There is one other thing I have noticed and want to tell you about. I do not know if it applies to England now also, because I have not been there since June. But here in Paris, for some strange reason, no one wears gloves when dancing the tango. And the result is that these clever Parisiennes have taken unusual care about their hands, which seem whiter and more attractive looking than ever, with superlatively polished nails. It has brought in a regular cult of dainty fingers, which I sincerely hope will spread across the channel. Just consider how grateful we ought to be to the tango, if for no other reason. When one thinks of the unappetising red fists such numbers of our countrywomen used to flourish. Here, at first, one had an inclination to laugh when one saw the mothers dancing the tango as well as the daughters. But if they do this in England, do not let yourself be spiteful about it, Caroline. The exercise is so splendid, and it keeps them young and inclined to be more sympathetic with their children. 
what is really ridiculous in these elderly ladies is to do anything, so disant, for pleasure, which is in reality a labour and a fatigue just because they want to be in the swim. But if mothers and chaperones honestly enjoy dancing and can find willing partners, why not let them indulge their desires in peace? If they have the dignity which they ought to have, they will realise the situations and the entertainments in and at which they ought to refrain from participating actively. But try to be tolerant, Caroline, in your judgment of them. For this is another remarkable feature which the spirit of this age has brought, the intense desire in everyone to keep young, and it is a good desire at its base. I do not dance the tango myself, although I am at the fashionable age, for it here, over forty. But it is not from principle, but because it would bore me terribly to have to do so. And I have arrived at a time of life when I can please myself about my amusements. But to you, who are young, I give this piece of worldly advice. Even if the tango does not particularly attract you, if it is the rage among your set, try to learn it, because otherwise you will soon begin to feel yourself left out and neglected, no matter how pretty and accomplished you are in other ways. For I know you well enough now to know that you are not strong enough, dear child, to turn a tide or make any considerable quantity of your friends follow your lead. There are only about three women in every age who can ever do this. So do not be offended with me for my plain speaking. And for a last word about the tango. Dance it if your friends dance it. And try to do it with the most perfect grace and modesty that diligent practice and natural refinement can suggest. It is hard work and nothing looks more unattractive than this dance when badly done. Be particularly careful how you hold yourself and how you permit your partner to hold you. And do try to keep your face from looking as though you were counting. If a thing which is supposed to be a recreation requires such concentration as that, it becomes no longer a pleasure to indulge in it yourself and gives none to those who are looking on at you doing it. There are still numbers of old-fashioned people who have never seen the tango and who talk the most incredible nonsense about it based on what they have heard. Let any of them see the dance beautifully performed and I'm sure all prejudice against it would be removed. But whether this is so or no, Caroline, I advise you, child, to enjoy it while you can, allowing good taste and good sense to guide you as to how you do it, where you do it, and when you do it. And now, goodbye, your affectionate godmother, E. G. End of Letter 7 Recording by Storylines, Devon End of Your Affectionate Godmother by Eleanor Glynn